One of the things that's keeping us from being happy, it's a very ironic thing. One of the things that's keeping us from being happy is trying to be happy. The more we put an emphasis in our lives on getting to a place where we're happy, the research proves the less happier we are. Now, you might not realize this, and you might not yet get it, but I had some thoughts about it, and I think, no, this is really actually true. And I think about this in a very picturesque way. That's how my mind works, so I want to give you the picture. And I thought about, you know, our emoticons that we've been dealing with all series long. Let's pull them out again for a little bit of... Uh, visual, if you will. So, you know, we want happy, but we are living it crappy, yes? <laughs> and what happens is we, te we tend to think like there's happiness over there, and we get into this place where we think, I will be happy when? When this happens, I will be happy. And so here's kind of how it works. You probably agree with this, but it always just seems like, like happiness is just out of the reach of my grasp. Or we actually get a hold of it. And then we get to that place that we imagine to be happy and we are still not as happy as we thought we were going to be. Because one of the things that a lot of researchers are finding out too, uh, and there's, there's a study done by a guy named Dan Gilbert about this, is that we always overestimate how happy we'll be with whatever we've imagined to be the happy place. And so we get to that place where we're not as happy as we, we thought we would be. So what do we, what do we immediately do? We think, okay, there must be another place to get to that'll make me happy. And we just do this from birth. We do this from, from like teenagehood on, right? When we're in high school, we're like, I'll be happy when I'm finally out of this thing in high school. Like right now I'm crabby, but that's college or, or, or job or work. Getting out of my parents' house is going to make me happy. So we just do all that we can and just kind of like, and we're still not as happy as we thought. Oh, no, it's not college. It's not, not more school. That was weird. I don't know why I thought there was more school would make me happy. When I get out of school, when I get a job, when I can finally make some money, live on my own, then I'll be happy. So we do the... And, and we've got like the, you know, the, the, in, the entry-level job, the entry-level income, the entry-level lifestyle is not as happy as we thought it was going to be, not making as much money as we thought we would make. And there's a lot of people with a lot more th things and stuff than life than us. And we're the new kid on the block. Nobody has respect for us. So maybe if I just, you know, I think I need to do this. I need to, I need to get married. That's what's going to do. That's what's going to make me happy. So we jump. <laughs> and we think, oh, I, I mean, well, I'm happy I'm married, but it's, yeah. They don't look the same in the morning as they did at night. I don't know what's going on. Like, what, what happened to this person I was dating? Who are they? I don't know. They have some weird quirks and all that stuff. And I didn't know they had that bad habit. Why didn't they tell me that while they were dating me? I don't get it. So, uh, maybe actually, you know what we need to do? We need to have some kids. And so we just... <laughs> then it's just this. Then it's just this. Come on. For like the first two years of each child, that's all you get right there, Okay. <laughs> maybe we get the kids out of the house. Okay, we've made up some ground. And maybe we get to that place where we can move to Florida and play golf all day. And, you know, and then we realize, wait a second, wait a second, there's nowhere else to jump to. The next place is death. Like, that's it. And, and here's, here's what we do is we've made happiness a place to get to rather than something to realize we could have right now. And we don't think about what this constant quest for happiness does, not just to us, but to the people who are around us. See, if your happy place is somewhere else, if your happy place is over here, and right now you're in the crappy place because the happy place is imagined to be over here, guess what the people who are around you get? Crappy you. Hashtag crappy you. Crappy you is not nice to be around. See, this is why some of you can't get married right here. Because you have it set up to be marriage is the ultimate happiness. And so until I'm married, I'll be crappy. And then you wonder you're so crappy. You wonder why nobody wants to date you. I don't get it. I don't get why nobody likes me. I don't get it. Well, it's probably because you're crappy. Like, put, a, put that frown upside down. Come on, somebody. You know, or, or you think, like, if I get that income, maybe if my boss will finally respect me and realize my value to the company, you know, and I get that income, or I get that promotion, or I get that position that I deserve, 
And until I get it, I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna put my best effort until I get what I deserve. Hashtag crappy. <laughs> and yeah, you're wondering why the boss doesn't promote you is because all you've given the boss is crappy. Oh, you don't have anything to say, do you? I'm hitting you right here, aren't I? Like this early on in the, in the message, it's getting too hot in here. But you know what I'm talking about? Like this is what we do. We always imagine that happiness is a place. And I want to talk to you about something that was actually coined by a British psychologist named Robert Holden. He calls it destination addiction. Destination addiction. The idea that there's a happy place somewhere else and we need to get there. And then we get there and there's another place. And then there's another place. And we, and we actually train our lives to think, that happiness will be somewhere else and we become addicted to the destination. And so I want this quote up on the screen because I love this quote about destination addiction. Beware of, a de beware of destination addiction, a preoccupation with the idea that happiness is in the next place, the next job, or with the next partner. Until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. I love that quote. Until you give up the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. And some of you are in a bad place right now um, emotionally because you have always imagined that something changing or happening or coming into your life is going to be the magic wand, the magic potion, the secret elixir that other people are drinking. That's why they're so much more happy than you are. And, and, and sometimes God gives you exactly what you want just to show you that what you want is not always all it's cracked up to be in your mind. And you have got to learn. You've got to learn this at some point to, ha to be happy with where God has you or you will never be happy where God brings you. I want you to write this down in your notes. First thing I want you to write down is like a foundational statement for the talk today. If happiness is a place, we will continually believe greater happiness is someplace else. If happiness is a place, we will continue to believe that greater happiness lies somewhere else. This is why people jump in and out of marriages, by the way, because they're not making me happy, and surely there's someone else out there who will make me happy, and so get, and, and again, this is what we're doing with our spouse right here. This is what we're doing with our spouse. Well, you're not living up to my expectations, and this marriage is not making me happy, and there's some figmentary, imaginary person out there somewhere who has the power to make me happy. And until I get to them, I'm just not going to be happy. And you wonder why your spouse doesn't actually help you because all you've given them is crappy you. Hashtag crappy you. And nobody wants to be married to crappy you. Nobody wants to be around crappy you. And this is a secret to happy people. This is a secret to people who live in the blessing of God. And I started this series by saying that Jesus is in the happiness business. Can, can I get a good amen for that? He wants you happy. I know he wants you happy because Matthew 5, verse 1, the very first message of Jesus, actually verse 3, the very first sermon of Jesus begins with the Greek word makarios. The word actually just means happiness. Happy are those who. And so when we come to Christ and when we start to learn how to do life, how he wants us to do life, there's happiness to be had. And so today, we're actually going to look at someone who learned how to be happy where he was. Even as, listen to this, the sun began to set on his life. It's one thing to be wide-eyed and misty-eyed when life is at the uphill, the, the climb, the increase. You know, the first part of your life. And you're climbing the ladder of success or the ladder of life, and you're getting somewhere, but... Come on, it's, it's another thing to be happy when you've crest the mountaintop. When you're actually looking at your life and you're saying there's less ahead of me than there was, is behind me. And here's the inevitable reality that all of us have to grapple with. Someday the sun is going to set on us. And we can spend the whole of our lives imagining that someplace, somewhere out there is a happy space that we'll finally someday get to, or we can learn how to be happy with where God has us. So today's happy habit is this, the habit of fulfilling God's purpose in the world. Okay, so what I'm going to share today is not a motivational speech. It's, 
it's for Christians. So please understand that if you're not a Christian, you might be helped by this, but you won't be changed by this. But if you're a Christian, this should change everything for you. I want to look at a guy in John chapter 3 who saw the sun setting on his life and took joy in the fact that he had done what God wanted him to do when God had him do it. And what was the secret behind? What was the equation that built his life into that kind of happiness? Okay, his name is John the Baptist. And his story is in John chapter 3, verse 22. Would you stand with me, everybody, as we read from God's word today? John 3, verse 22, here's what it says. After this, verse 22, after this, after what? After Jesus had just gotten done talking with a guy named Nicodemus. Very famous passage of scripture. That's where John 3, 16 comes from. Most famous passage of scripture ever, right? And so after the conversation with Nicodemus, here's what happens. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and he remained there with him and was baptizing. John, this is John the Baptist, not John Jesus' apostle. John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because their water was plentiful there. Now, why does this mention water was plentiful? Because John's ministry was very successful. He needed a lot of water to baptize a lot of people. And people were coming and being baptized for John had not yet been put in prison. Verse 25, now a discussion arose, and that word discussion just means debate. Like There's a, there's a debate here, and there's a debate between some of John's disciples and a Jew, uh, a non-disciple of John, over purification, over baptism. What is baptism? Why is John baptizing? I mean, John's in the wilderness baptizing, and, and usually we get baptized right before we go into the temple, so why does he have the right to do it out here in the desert, and, and, and we're supposed to do it near the temple? So this is discussion, a little debate, little debate that stirs up. Aren't you glad that we're past the days where religious people debate about anything? Okay, that was a joke. All right, here we go. And they came to him, verse 26, and they came to John and they said, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, and the he there is Jesus. Jesus who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness. That's another way of saying, the guy that you said was the Christ. The guy that you said, this is the real one. Look, he's baptized. And all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ. I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, that's me, he says, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy this joy of mine is now complete. John, didn't you just hear what they said? They just said people are going to Jesus' church and they're leaving your church. Yeah, no, no. This joy is mine and it's now complete. Now look at this last verse. Love it. You guys have probably heard this somewhere else, but here it is. He must increase and I must decrease. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, I ask that we will hear you today. And I pray that our hearts will be open to what you want to plant in our spirits, in our being. Holy Spirit, I ask as we pray every week, help us see Jesus and him only. In his mighty name we pray and everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a seat. Are you a dog person or a cat person? Don't answer. Before you say, well, I would like dogs in my house or I love dogs or I love cats or whatever, that's what I'm asking. Are you a dog type person or are you a cat type person? You say, I don't know what the difference is. There's a difference. And I know there's a difference because I have something to share with you. I have excerpts from a dog's diary and a cat's diary. And I have them for you to hear. Because these two animals are completely different. And to hear how they respond to their world is completely different. So I want to share with you. A dog's view of his world. Here we go. Excerpts from a dog's diary. 8 a.m. Dog food. My favorite thing. 9.30 a.m. A car ride. 
my favorite thing. 9.40 a.m., a walk in the park, my favorite thing. 10.30 a.m., got rubbed and patted, my favorite thing. Lunch, my favorite thing at one o'clock. 3 p.m., wagged my tail, my favorite thing. 5 p.m., milk bones, my favorite thing. 7 p.m., got to play ball, my favorite thing. 8 p.m., watch TV with the people, my favorite thing. 11 p.m., sleeping on the bed, my favorite thing. Excerpts from a cat's diary. Day number 952 of my captivity. <laughs> my captives continue to start, my captors continue to taunt me with bizarre little dangling objects. They dine lavishly on fresh meat while I'm forced to eat dry cereal. The only thing that keeps me going is the hope of escape with the mild satisfaction I get from ruining the occasional piece of furniture. Today, I almost was successful in an attempt to assassinate one of my tormentors by weaving around his legs as he was walking. I must try this again tomorrow, but this time from the top of the stairs. Tomorrow, I will eat another houseplant and vomit on the carpet. <laughs> Are you a cat person or a dog person? You know, one has a view like, this is cool. This is great. I'm so excited about where I'm doing, what I'm doing and where I'm at. And then the other one, the other one is just miserable and imagining that there's a happy place somewhere else. Beware of destination addiction because you don't know how you would feel when you get there. You don't. You're imagining it. And you've got to learn how to be happy where you are because you'll never be happy where you get to if you don't. John is looking at his life. John the Baptist now. He's the predecessor of Jesus. All right, this is hard. And the thing about John is, he's got this really popular ministry, and it's, it shouldn't happen. Like, um, John wears camel skin and a leather sash around his waist, the Bible says. It also says that he eats locusts and wild honey. This is not your average ordinary guy. And he's out in the wilderness, and his message is not, like, a friendly one. His message is basically one word. Repent! Repent, you sinners! And get baptized and show God that you're serious for once. I mean, that's his thing. And you know what the Bible says? Everybody went out to see him. I mean, he had, he had the crowds coming to his church. And then he had the opportunity to introduce to the world Jesus. He's like, this is the one, the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. This is the guy. I'll baptize him. I baptize you with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There's nobody like this guy. I'm not even, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And guess what? The people listen. Jesus starts his church. And John shows up to preach one Sunday, and there's some empty seats for the first time in years. And then a couple of weeks later, there's not empty seats, there's empty rows. And then it's not empty rows, it's empty sections. And one of the deacons at John the Baptist Church comes and says, John, pastor, um, we got a problem. You know the guy that you made such a big deal out of a couple of weeks ago? Well, <laughs> everybody that you had in your church... You know how they told you they were going to go on vacation? No, they just really went to his church. They're all over there. Like your song leader is over there. Your, your choir director actually just left last week. In fact, I'm thinking about going. He's like, what are you doing? Your job is coming to an end. What is going on? We're on the decline. And John the Baptist sees in his life, he sees the sun is setting on his life. And he's happy about it. He says, I mean, could you imagine this being your reality? The, 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 the one who has the bride is the bridegroom, he says in verse 21. I'm the friend. 
And I stand and I rejoice. I rejoice greatly that he's here. This joy of mine is complete. In other words, John lived and settled in his life before anybody came and questioned what was going on in his life. He settled something that you got to settle and I got to settle and every follower of Jesus Christ has to settle on this earth or we, or we will be miserable. We got to settle this, that God has me where he wants me to do what he wants me to do for his glory and it's not about me. The happiness equation. So three realities about John the Baptist that I think helped him get there. Number one, the happiness equation. We're going to build a, all the points are going to become one point, but we're going to build it piece by piece. So the first, the first part of the equation is divine design. To have a sense that you have been divinely designed by your Father in heaven. To see that you were conceived on purpose. And I'm talking about conception. And uh, this is John's story, John the Baptist. Uh, you, you, we have actually his birth story as well as Jesus' birth story. They're kind of parallel together. Uh, he is actually born to an elderly couple who are, the Bible says, past the age of bearing children. His mom's name is Elizabeth. She's actually Mary's cousin. And um, his father's name is Zechariah. He's a priest of Israel, and there's, a, there's an angel that comes to Elizabeth and tells old, past childbearing years, Elizabeth, you're going to have a baby, and he's going to be mighty in the sight of the Lord. He's going to preclude or prelude the coming of Jesus, uh, the Son of God. And then the, Ze and then the angel goes to Zechariah, his father, in the temple and says, you're gonna have, your, your wife is going to have a child. And, and Zechariah doesn't even believe it. Like The high priest, the, the priest, the religious guy is like, I don't believe you. What are you talking about? She's way past the age of having children. And the angel's like, okay, just for that, you're not going to talk now. And so he calls, causes Zechariah to be mute until John the Baptist is born. When John's born, Zechariah writes down his name. His name is John on a piece of paper, and God unmutes Zechariah's tongue, and, and he speaks, and everybody's like, what's going to become of this child? And the angel had said to Zechariah, this is what he says, uh, he will turn. This is Luke 1, 16. This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready... For the Lord, a people prepared. I mean, just imagine, like, this is what was said about John the Baptist before John the Baptist was born. And you have to imagine that at some point in little Johnny's life, like before he was the Baptist, because before he was the Baptist, he was little Johnny, and he was going to soccer, and he was going to the playground, and... And suddenly he realized, as he looked at all the other kids that he was playing soccer with, that their moms were all so much younger than his mom. And so at some point he comes to mom and says, why are you so old? And, <laughs> and mom says, all right, well, let me tell you. Here's what happened. I shouldn't have had children. And the angel came and he said he was gonna, you were going to come and then went to your father. And dad, of course, didn't believe the angel. I believed him, but dad didn't believe him. But anyway, anyway, eventually, you know, you came along. And by the way, you've got a great calling on your life because you shouldn't even be here. Could you imagine what that does to the spirit of John at a young age? You mean to tell me that God thought of me? Whoa. Significance. Divine design. Now you say, well, that's great for John the Baptist, but my story is totally different. My father was an alcoholic. My parents weren't even married when I was conceived. I was an accident. I was always supposed to be somebody else's kid. My mom yelled at me and asked me to be more like my older brother. I don't have that kind of story. What are you talking about, Pastor? And here's what I need you to do. I need you to turn to what God's Word says about you instead of what other people have said about you. Because the Bible says in Psalm 139, and this is a psalm that we're all called to sing. The psalms are the hymn book of Israel, the hymn book of God's people. We're called to say this about ourselves. Here's what he says. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. By the way, that right there, that verse right there is why every Christian should be pro-life. Right there. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. He's talking to God here, and I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious, oh, look at this. How precious are your thoughts about me, oh God. They cannot be numbered. What have you thought that about yourself? You say, I have a hard time thinking about that. You need to get in the word of God to learn what he says about you. Because he's got some good things to say about you. You say, that's Old Testament, that Psalm. That's Old Testament. Okay, New Testament then. Ephesians 1, 4. Even before he made the world, like, like before your parents got here, before their parents got here, before anybody's parents got here, before he made the world, God loved us. How could God love somebody who wasn't even here yet? Because he's God. From everlasting to everlasting, he's this little thing called omnipotence, omniscience. He knows everything. And so he's loved us and he chose us in Christ Jesus to be holy and without fault in his eyes. The very next verse, Ephesians 1, 5, God decided, say the next two words, everybody. God decided what? In advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. Like you are the pleasure of God. I know you got your faults. I know you got your issues. I know you are a mess in some ways. Everybody is. But God took pleasure in putting people into your life that brought you to the point where you realized that you needed to give your life to him. You coming to Christ was not God saying, oh, really, you? I didn't want you to come. I wanted, like, you know, only the really nice, good-looking people. What's up with this guy? No, God was like, yes! The scripture says in Zephaniah, says he rejoices over his people with singing. woo <laughs> I love that. God loves you. He loves you so much. He's up in heaven saying, I just love you. <laughs> Light of my life. Like, I mean, that's what he's doing, right? He's like, I don't deserve this. This is not, I can't accept it. Okay, I know you can't deserve it. Guess what? God knows he, you can't deserve it. And he told us he, we couldn't deserve it. 2 Timothy 1.9. God saved us and called us to a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan. There it is again, from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. You need to read the Old Testament because in the Old Testament, you see how many bad people God kept using choosing and using. I think about Jephthah. Jephthah is a guy we don't talk about enough in the church, but this guy's story is so cool. Jephthah is part of this huge family, but he, out of all his siblings, is the only one who was the son of a prostitute. All his siblings from mom, he's the accident child. His dad couldn't control himself and had a bad night child. And his brothers let him hear it. When they got old enough, they said, you are not one of us. We don't want you. Get out. And he left. And he went, the scripture says that he hooked up with some worthless people. You know why he hooked up with some worthless people? Because he felt worthless himself. Some people feel like, why are they always acting that way? Because they feel worthless, friend. Some Christians are so good at judging non-Christians. We're so good. They feel worthless. That's why they do the things that they do. Many of them. Not all of them, but some of them. And so he hooks up with these worthless people. And these, the word worthless means that they were kind of like, you know, gang members. They were bad apples. They were fighters and brawlers. And so Jeff is hanging with all these bad people. And then his family back at home, the Bible says, comes under attack from some nation next door. And they don't know how to fight these bad people. And so guess what they do? They call up Jephthah. They're like, hey, bro, sorry about the whole you don't belong here thing, but we got some guys that are going to kick our butts if you don't get out here and help us. And Jephthah says, I'll come and help. And God uses Jephthah's bad, bad experiences with some bad people to actually win an important battle for God's people. 
Why are you sharing this, Pastor? Because I'm trying to tell you that God can redeem anything the devil or other people have handed you that you didn't want. Absolutely. Divine design is not that you went to Bible college or you went to Sunday school or you graduated CCD with flying colors. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the God who is able to redeem whatever the devil hands us in our lives and use it for his ultimate good. This is true for anyone that's listening to me right now. I think about that movie. He reminds me of Jeff. To, um, it's, the movie's called Machine Gun Preacher. You need to watch this movie. It's so amazing. It uh, stars Gerard Butler, and he's Sam, he plays Sam Childers, who's a drug addict, a drug dealer, and becomes an armed guard for a drug gang. And he's dating, sleeping with other men's wives. He's just a, man, he's a mess. And then he falls in love with the stripper, marries her, and she wants them to go to the church that she grew up in because she's empty. So he goes, and he, he comes to Christ. He gets baptized. And he goes on a mission trip with the church to the Sudan. And he's in the middle of Sudan, and he walks by this, the remains of a child's body that had been blown up by a landmine. He falls to his knees and he just says, God, I will give the rest of my life to make sure that this never happens again. He goes back to America and he gets his guns from his drug running days. Not his Bible, his guns. Brought the Bible too. But he brings them over and he starts fighting the, I, uh, I think it's Boko Haram or some, some group of people that are kidnapping little kids and selling them into the sex slavery trade. And he's rescuing with guns and military power to rescue these kids from sex slavery. He's got an orphanage. They teach the kids the Bible. It's running and it's like growing. I mean, he's still doing it to this day. And, 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 and people criticize this guy. Like, oh, you shouldn't do that. You know, you're a Christian. He's like, listen to me. Everybody says that until it's their kid that's stolen. And if I tell you that I can get your kid, you will not give one rip how I go about doing it. And what I'm trying to tell you about Sam Childers is he was a drug runner. He was a, he was a machine guy, a machine gun guy. He was a gun guy. And God says, I'll take you and I'll redeem you and I will use you to save my precious children in the middle of slavery. You know, Christians, we have got to get over the idea that God only uses the clean-cut people. Right you realize that if there was a pastor search committee for a new pastor in church in America, that we would see David come through and say, sorry, adulterer and murderer. We'd see Moses come through, sorry, you tried to kill a guy. Actually, you did kill a guy. We'd see Noah come through and say, you were a drunk, sorry. We would, we would actually reject every single guy God actually used. Oh, you know, Peter, you know, you had a lot of going for you, but you denied Jesus three times publicly. Sorry. God uses the people that you don't think he can use. And that's good news for everybody here who thinks God can't use them. God takes your life, all the things that you've been handed, all the things. And what if you saw it like this? What if you saw it like this? The parents that you had or didn't have, the hardships that you faced, the struggles that you presently have, what if you saw that as the tapestry of design that God has woven together to make you perfect for the mission he has assigned to you? Number two, we got to add to divine design heaven-sent purpose, which is what John the Baptist does. So this debate starts, right? With John's, like, like, lead deacon, I just feel like his lead deacon is having a debate about, you know, John's mission and everything, and then they're hearing, yeah, well, anyway, it doesn't really matter, because John's church is actually shrinking, and Jesus' church is growing, so, you know, who cares, actually? And John's deacon starts thinking, oh, wait a second, that's true, and he runs over to John, and he says, John, uh, the church is, like, losing members, and Jesus' church is growing members, and, and don't you know, don't you know, Christian, don't you know, that in that moment, the human side of John the Baptist had to have a moment of just rearing up in his spirit. That's right, John. Bad news for you. Your best days are behind you. You got nothing left. It's over. 
And he could have given into that. He could have given into that woe is me spirit. He could have given that, into that attitude. But no, he had already settled something in his heart before anybody challenged it. Here's what he says. Verse 27. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from heaven. All that I've got, heaven gave me. All that I don't have, heaven said, that's not for you. This is how you got to see your life, friend. You've got to see your life because God knows what he's doing with you. And this is where you got to settle it. You got to say, I might not be that person. I'm not supposed to be them. I'm not supposed to look like that person. I'm not supposed to be that person. I'm supposed to be me. God designed me. God sent me. God has a purpose for me. In, John, in, in, in verse 28, he says, look, I already told you about this. I told you that I'm not the Christ. I've been sent. Somebody say sent. You need to see this in your life, Christian. You've been sent. Sent by God to that job that you might not like right now. Sent by God to those kids in that school. Maybe they've been sent to you. Maybe you got that difficult child. You know, you had, you had like six good kids and you had that seventh one. You're like, what the heck? <laughs> this one's going to put me in my grave. This one's going to really sap it out. This one's, I don't know what, ah. Like you're just like, I thought I was a good parent until this one showed up. And you don't know, maybe that kid has got nuclear power in Christ just stored up in him. And that's why your job is to make sure that is well restrained and well maintained so that when he finally explodes, he doesn't destroy lives, but empowers them. Come on, somebody. I mean, sometimes it's the ones that you least expect, right? And, or, or maybe you're thinking, like, like the job that you hate right now and the people that make fun of you right now and everybody who disrespects your faith and you think they're never going to ever listen to me, maybe you're not the guy that convinces them that Jesus is the answer. Maybe you're just the guy who takes their worst shots so that they get worn out. <laughs> And the person that comes after you leads them to Jesus. I know we all want to be the superstar Christian with a thousand conversions behind us. With all, you know, witnessing. Jesus said to the disciples about the Samaritan woman, he says, listen, I'm sending you to fields that you did not plant and you did not work for. Others have done the work, and you're going to harvest the fruit of their labors. That's how the kingdom works. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who provided the increase. You're just a part of God's big heaven-sent purpose for his church. This is why we're always telling you, guys, listen, new people to Waters Church, this is why we're always telling you, go to Growth Track. Go find out about what's, what Waters Church is. Don't just come. Be the church. Be what we're doing. Do what we're, help us do what we're doing. We, we want you to help us with our kids' ministry, our parking ministry. Uh, this is what Night to Shine is all about, that we are not just a people who gather geographically at this spot on a map on Sunday, but we leave this place to spread the glory of Jesus everywhere. Which leads me to the number three. Designed, a divine design plus heaven-sent purpose plus people's benefit equals completed joy. You got to add that third one, friend. People's benefit. Who is getting blessed through you? Not just you being blessed. Who's getting blessed through you? I, we, this is where our world misses it. This is where our world misses it big time. Because we are the Instagram gen. We are the Instagram generation. Now I'm so tired of it. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> Went to the beach today with the fam. Hashtag blessed. Snap, snap. <laughs> Watching the game tonight. Hashtag blessed, snap, snap. 
My, my, my husband emptied the dishwasher, men of God, hashtag blessed. <laughs> At Waters Church today, hashtag blessed. <laughs> Fine, you're blessed. Who is being blessed by your blessing? You see, this is how God works. When he calls Abraham, he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And not just bless you. You will be a blessing. Man, if you're not blessing others, I don't know what the blessing's for. And Christians, we got a man up here. We got to stop waiting. We got to stop saying, well, I'll do it when. When what? Well, I'll, 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 I'll serve, but I only want to do this. What? Would Jesus say that? Well, I'll serve, but I want to be notified well in advance. Seriously? Sometimes it's just last minute, man. Can you just, can you just go with the flow? The Holy Spirit is equated to fire, water, and wind. None of those three things are very controllable. They're spontaneous. They just happen. Can you just happen? Can you just say, I will clean up. I will pick up things. I will sweep floors in the house of my God if it will make people know how good my Jesus really is. But can you, can you get to that level? Because honestly, I'm sick and tired of seeing so many Christians thinking about being blessed and not thinking about doing blessing for people beyond themselves. That's how John lived with joy. They're, let me get this straight. They're leaving my church to go to Jesus' church? That's a good thing. That he can change them. I can awaken them. I can shake them up. But he can fix them. He can transform them. He can heal them. And your life, Christian, is meant to point people to him. He must increase and we must decrease. The last thing I want you to write down is the Christian's life is not about getting somewhere. It's about glorifying someone. And you can do that